Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for this emergency meeting on the plight of the Uyghurs. My name is Phil Rosenberg, and I'm Director of Public Affairs at the Board of Deputies of British Jews, the national representative body of the UK Jewish community for 260 years. With so much happening at the moment, we are really grateful to parliamentarians for taking the time to join us. I'll come back to Nusrat Ghani in a minute. With just a few days' notice, we have with us a former leader of the Conservative Party in Sir Ian Duncan Smith, the Shadow Foreign Secretary Lisa Nandy, Liberal Democrat Home Affairs Spokesperson and Chair of the APPG on the Uyghurs, Alastair Carmichael, the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Tom Tugendhat, and the originator of this amendment, Lord Alton, as well as so many others. And this attests to the seriousness with which you all take this issue, and we very, very much appreciate it. We continue to be grateful to the co-chairs of the APPG on British Jews, Christian Wakeford and Wes Streeting, uh, for their ongoing support on this and so much else. We're particularly pleased, if I may say, to be and honoured to be joined by Rahima Mahmoud, the UK representative of the World Uyghur Congress, who has done so much to raise awareness of this grave issue. Friends, you may know that later in this month, on the 27th of January, we will mark Holocaust Memorial Day. Many of you actively support this, and I would encourage you to continue to do so when it comes around again this year. And you will understand that as a community, we are hesitant to consider comparisons to the murder of six million Jews and many others by the Nazis. You'll understand the reasons for that. But even so, the Board of Deputies uh, President, Marie, when she wrote to the Chinese ambassador here, said, nobody could fail to notice the similarities between what is alleged to be happening in the People's Republic of China today and what happened in Nazi Germany five years ago. People being forcibly loaded onto trains, beards of religious men being trimmed, women being sterilized, and the grim spectre of concentration camps. Every year on Holocaust Memorial Day, we say never again. And yet it has happened again, over and over again. In Cambodia, in Rwanda, in Bosnia, in Darfur, and now it appears in Xinjiang, China. As we see this devastating reality, we at the Board of Deputies of British Jews have to ask, what choice will Britain and the world make this time? Are we willing to stand aside and do nothing as millions of people are herded into concentration camps, as people stigmatize their ethnicity and religion are made to do forced labor, as women are forcibly sterilized, as children are cruelly separated from their parents? Will we leave the door open to potentially striking a preferential trade deal with the perpetrators and saying business as usual? Or will we oppose this with every means at our disposal? And I want to stress, we are not against China. We're not against the people of China. We're not against the peaceful rise of China. We are genocide. It is not too late to act. Together, we can make the Chinese government very much aware that should they continue in this way, there will be international consequences. Next week, when the bill comes before the House, we would urge you to take a, 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 a strong lead for Britain that the world can follow. We urge every MP listening to this to use your vote to support the amendment to the trade bill. And we urge the UK government and all parties to listen to the very many MPs across the House who support this amendment. As the great Rabbi Hillel taught, if not now, when? I'll now hand over to Nusrat Ghani, MP for Weldon and the godmother of the amendment in the House of Commons who will chair this discussion. Thank you, Nusrat. Thank you so much, Phil. That was such a powerful introduction and I must put on record our gratitude to the Board of Deputies for hosting this event and being so forceful in, in showing your support for what we're trying to do. If I am the godmother of this amendment, then Anne Duncan Smith and Bob Seeley are the joint godfathers of the amendment and Lord Alton has given birth to the amendment. So there's a lot of people to thank and I will introduce them shortly. I think most people listening will think this is a no-brainer, but often the simplest things to do in politics when we're trying to legislate can become incredibly complicated. So for all of those listening who are members of parliament or all of those listening who can lobby their MP, the point we're trying to make is that next Tuesday, the genocide amendment will return to the House of Commons in the trade bill, and we need to have enough people supporting this amendment. The amendment is quite simple. We're entering a new phase for our country's history. And as we start establishing our own trade deals, we need to make sure we're starting off in the right place morally 
as well as in ensuring that we're doing the best trade deals that we can for our country. We have previously relied on the United Nations to investigate and decide if a genocide is taking place, but many people listening will know that the United Nations does not have the ability to do that because of a number of countries who can veto those investigations taking place. So the amendment is quite neat. It basically establishes a high court situation in the UK that those people that reach the market are being able to put their case forward can have it investigated. It is such a high threshold to reach a decision on genocide. It's right, it's done by the legal experts. Those legal experts can then provide that advice to government and government can then take that forward. This amendment does not stop any trade deal. It does not stop the Foreign Office or the Department of International Trade doing what they need to do. But it drops a little pebble in a very large lake and says we need to stop and think about who we are trading with. Often colleagues will say this, issue, this situation is, the issue is too big. It's taking place in the country so far away. But the point is we are consuming goods that are made by the Uyghur in prison camp circumstances. So it impacts us here right now in the UK. And it's very rare that you have a bill and for that bill to be perfect for an amendment to allow us to start this process going forward. So I have to introduce a number of speakers before Well, as Lord Alton, we also have a barrister with us, Arif Abraham, who can also answer any of your difficult questions. So please do not be shy about putting any question forward. The first person I'm going to introduce who will have four to five minutes to speak is the wonderful Lord Alton, who has been managing this amendment over in the House of Lords and finally gets to send it over to us in the House of Commons on Tuesday. Lord Alton, the floor is yours for four minutes. Thank you very much, Nurs. It's a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I'm very conscious that we've recently commemorated the 75th anniversary of the Nuremberg trials and the crafting, indeed, of the word genocide itself by Raphael Lemkin, 49 of whose relatives have been murdered during the Holocaust. A few months ago, I stood at a genocide site in northern Iraq at Simile, where Assyrians and Armenians were murdered. It was those events which had drawn Lemkin into a study of mass atrocities. And of course, Hitler would say famously, infamously, who now remembers the Armenians? And that has been the story of genocides, of them happening and people forgetting what occurred. During that same visit, I met Yazidi leaders. Previously, I'd been to Burma and met with Rohingya leaders and visited a village the day after their homes had been burnt to the ground. And I went to Darfur, which you was mentioned uh, by Phil in the, in the introductory remarks. That was a genocide that killed 300,000 people and displaced 2 million more. On return, I wrote a report which The Independent carried on the front page under the headline, If This Isn't Genocide, What Is? At the time, I spoke to the much-loved, now late, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Lord Sachs, and was greatly encouraged by the Board of Deputies as I campaigned at the time for genocide charges to be brought against Omar al-Bashir. That's the background then to my private members' bills on genocide determination, which I and Fiona Bruce in the House of Commons have laid over the last three years. Given the chance, though, in this trade bill, we, could, we saw that here was an opportunity to table the principles that underpin those private members' bills and it was carried in the House of Lords by a massive majority of 129. Let me re-emphasize, this wasn't a, a, an amendment just coming from one independent crossbench peer or from a few uh, colleagues. This was supported from the front benches of the opposition parties, though it had official support from those front benches. And more importantly, in many ways, given the politics that we have to deal with, it, in, it was sponsored by my colleague, Lord Forsyth, uh, former cabinet member in a conservative government. It was sponsored by Ian Duncan Smith, former chief whip, uh, Lord Blencathra. It was supported in the vote by Eric Pickles, a former chairman of the Conservative Party, and by conservative peers like Lord Polak, who will be well known to many members of the board. 
from the cross benches. It receives support from people like Lady Deitch, who, of course, hardly needs instruction about the horrors of the Holocaust, and from two former Supreme Court judges and the Lord Chief Justice, the former Lord Chief Justice, Harry Wolfe, Lord Wolfe. Now, the debate, if people want to read it, is on my website. We've got many important speeches to hear this afternoon. So let me just conclude by saying that for too long, governments of all parties have refused to name the crime above all crimes, genocide, for the crime that it is. And as you're right, the threshold that has to be demonstrated is an incredibly high one. You have to demonstrate that not just even crimes against humanity have taken place, but this is a deliberate attempt to destroy a community on the basis of their ethnicity or their religion. Now, clearly, with one million Uyghurs in camps in Xinjiang, an area that I personally visited before these events took place, but nevertheless, during those visits, I met with the Muslim community, and already they could see the writing on the wall. Why? Because of what was happening in neighboring Tibet to Buddhists there whose own religious, uh, op religious life and spiritual cultural life was being destroyed by the same forces in the Chinese Communist Party, not the people of China, but by the CCP. Now it's naive at best and deliberately deceptive at worst to suggest that China would not use a veto at the Security Council and would refer itself to the allegations that now stand against it to the International Criminal Court even with a million Uyghurs in prison camps being used as slave labor and allegations of appalling crime that Phil has outlined to us, including forced organ harvesting, which Sir Geoffrey Nice's independent tribunal concluded has taken place. It's impossible to get those charges and those evidence before the International Criminal Court. For all those reasons, why don't we have the confidence, which is what this amendment does, the confidence to lay the evidence before the High Court of England and Wales and to ensure that groups like the Uyghur Muslims have an opportunity to lay the evidence before a court of law and to demonstrate what is happening to them. And let that then have an impact on our policies, not least trade. It shouldn't be business as usual with people who are responsible for crimes against humanity and the ultimate crime of genocide. Thank you so much, Lord Alton. And I must put on record that you sit on the um, International Foreign Affairs Committee um, and we're so grateful for all the work that you've done. And I hope that with my colleagues, Anne Duncan-Smith and Bob Seeley and everybody else on the call, we can do this amendment justice. Uh, before I introduce Rahima, um, who will explain the situation, um, what's happening on the ground because her family are still in Xinjiang. One of the important things that was raised by the Foreign Secretary at the dispatch box this week was the vile crime that has led to the 85% drop in birth rate of Uyghur women. Now, if there was any marker of genocide, it is a situation like that, where a, huge, a generation of Uyghurs just are disappearing from the landscape. So Rahima, if you can hear me, um, if you could um, possibly contribute for about five minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a privilege for me to uh, to speak at this event. Um, as a director of the World Uyghur Congress UK, I am pleading to you to support the amendment. Uh, we, the Uyghurs diaspora, desperately need a judicial decision regarding what is happening to our friends and loved ones in our homeland. And as governments repeatedly tell us what that without uh, this cannot fulfill um, uh, their obligations on the Genocide Convention uh, without any um, court determination. And uh, um, this week on Tuesday, uh, The Guardian published uh, one of the camp survivors' testimony, Gulbahar Haidwaji. And uh, uh, this is what she said, they had tortured my body and brought my mind to the edge of madness, women like me who emerged from the camp are no longer who we once were. We are shadows, our souls are dead. Now I'm also working uh, on another news report with the BBC, and this is a testimony from Tursnai Ziavudun. I will just read out uh, one part, which is absolutely horrific. The second time, it was after a week had passed, they took me there. Ah, my life. Perhaps this is the most unforgettable scar for me forever. 
I don't want the words to spill out from my mouth to tell anyone. It is so difficult for me to talk about it. I wish to forget even to think about it. But because I think that our entire fellow countrymen might be subjected to it, and I am, I know I am a finished person. They were three men, not one, three. They did whatever evil their mind could think of, and they didn't spare any part of the body. They bit everywhere, leaving horrible marks to the extent that it was disgusting to look at. And I experienced that three times, three times. Almost everyone in the camp, all the women are subjected to it. And I worked as a consultant and translator for the documentary on the China, on the cover China's digital gulag. And I was horrified when the Chinese official, when he was asked whether he felt Uyghur's human rights were being violated. And he responded by saying, they don't have human rights. It is not about violation. They just don't have human rights. So we know that uh, I'm not going to repeat again, again, what is happening uh, is not a secret anymore. We, the Uyghurs, whether we're living in our homeland and uh, like myself living in a free country, like in UK suffering, and by telling the story that I am putting my loved ones in great risk. And the people like Tursunai, she's also bravely talking about her most terrible experience because she believes that the world will act if she tell the world. Therefore, I believe that this is a list that people can do. Thank you very much. Rahima, thank you so much. We know that you are in the most difficult position every time you speak about this issue because of the impact it can have on your family. But we are incredibly grateful for you being with us here this evening. I'm going to turn next to Tom Tuganat, who chairs the Foreign Affairs Select Committee and has been investigating links back to China, including supply chain links. And Tom, I always find it peculiar that colleagues can so passionately sp speak about how environmentally friendly her trade has to be um, and how ethical her trade policy has to be, but they seem to be slightly shy talking about how humane her trade policy needs to be. Tom, over to you, five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Noz. It's a pleasure to be back with you, uh, as you were a wonderful member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. So, uh, so your presence uh, is is very welcome as we're looking into uh, Xinjiang goods in in uh, UK uh, markets. This is something that many of us have felt very strongly about for a long time. As you know, the Foreign Affairs Committee has been looking at the way that autocracies and dictatorships uh, try to influence democracies in many different ways. We've looked at uh, dirty Russian money. We've looked at uh, academic freedoms being infringed by uh, things like the Confucius Institute and indeed by the Chinese uh, embassy officials in the UK. But perhaps the worst way in which we can be uh, brought down to the level of the tyrannical states is by finding ourselves complicit in these awful crimes. Now, many years ago, two centuries ago, it was not uncommon to find that sugar bowls were painted red with blood to remind people who took sugar where it came from, the slave fields of the Caribbean. And today it would be right to remember that Chinese cotton comes with the mark of Cain as well and the mark of blood. Now there was a time many years ago, in the early 1800s, mid 1800s, when we spent 2% of our national budget on fighting slavery with the West African squadron. Today, it's a much lower price, but we know that the price is paid not by us, but by people in Western China. So this is uh, an opportunity, I think, when the UK really must uh, make clear its opposition. I hope very much the government listens. And I hope very much that we make the uh, changes that we need to ensure that uh, goods that come from uh, slave states and slave production are stopped long before they arrive at our border. Because the idea is not actually to stop the goods arriving. It's to stop them ever being produced. It's to close the production, not to close the market. So this is a, an opportunity for us to make a, a stand 
not about us, in, the, in fact, not really even about the United Kingdom, but about the production of slave goods that are now sadly becoming too frequent uh, again. So I'm delighted that uh, the Board of Deputies, an organisation that has stood uh, for human rights and for the rights of minorities, not just the Jewish faith, but, uh, but minorities all over the world for many, many years, is making this stand again. I'm sorry to say that we are fighting slavery in the UK again for the first time in hundreds of years. Uh, but this is an important battle and one that uh, has come to, sadly, many shops and many homes in the UK without anyone's knowledge. So raising awareness, resisting the purchase of slave goods and making sure that our government stands against it, I think are very important things for us to do now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. We're incredibly grateful for your support. And next I come to the Right Honourable Ian, um, Sir Ian Duncan Smith. And as I said earlier, if I'm the godmother, then Ian, then you must be the godfather. And you definitely look like that tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, it is a huge privilege to be here actually at this. Um, the truth is that uh, it's it's a privilege because I, I see around us uh, uh, all those, A, who have spoken, I want to come back to that, but also I see Lisa Nandy, I see Alistair Carmichael, I see, of course, uh, all the others that are there, and of course, Lord Alton, uh, all from different parties. No party owns genocide, and nor should it be a party political problem. So the government should not see this in terms of party politics. They should see it in terms of right and wrong. It's a very simple choice, but a complex decision. And so on that basis, it's worth reminding ourselves, I think, uh, agreeing with everything that has been said before, uh, that it was a Jewish lawyer, Raphael Lemkin, in 1943, who coined the term genocide. Uh, in his case, it was genus from the Greek, meaning race or tribe, uh, and side, which is to kill from Latin. So although we, uh, the Holocaust was not the only uh, time on record when genocide has been practiced, uh, that definition in 1943 always brings us back to the concept of the Holocaust, because it was the first time that any such event uh, could be so termed. <clears throat> and on that basis, I want to hugely congratulate uh, in this particular case, how difficult it must be for Rahima to be here and to constantly promote this. My heart goes out to you. Uh, you spoke movingly uh, for everybody. Uh, and you said something which touched a nerve. It took us back to the 1940s. You said uh, that uh, the Uyghurs, uh, it was said that the Uyghurs by the Chinese authorities had no rights. They had no rights. That reminds me of the way in which the Jews were treated in the 1940s uh, as termed as untermensch, people with no humanity. So what you did to them didn't matter. They were just so much vermin to be treated as such. And that, is, I think, is what is going on. And so I said to say to my colleagues, uh, on Tuesday, for I think it will be Tuesday, when this bill returns, you face a very simple choice. The government says at the moment, as all governments do, uh, not this, not here, not now. So the answer to that is to ask them this question. Exactly what, where and when? When is it right to make a stand? When is it right to say that uh, we have another bill coming down the road or something else that will happen or we will generate something? The answer is we need this. This is passed. It's from the Lords. It's coming to us. And we must decide simply whether we think this is such a crime that it now needs to have a court for the first time ever a domestic court admittedly, judge it. Who is going to get that judgment if we don't start that? And I know that others will follow suit. Others will so follow suit. And so we need to make that choice. And if I could just end by reading this to anybody who may or may not remember this from Pastor Niemöller. First they came for the socialists. I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I didn't speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak for me. If we in the mother of parliaments do not speak for those who are benighted and trashed by authorities, then frankly, I don't think we deserve to be in that mother of parliaments. And I hope my colleagues will agree with me.
the end, thank you. Another powerful contribution. Thank you so much. Um, please use the chat forum if you're shy about asking a question. And next, can I ask um, Lisa to contribute for about five minutes? Lisa and Andy, over to you, please. Yeah. Sorry, I was just trying to unmute. It wouldn't be a Zoom call, would it, without someone failing to use the technology properly? Um, thank you so much, Nuss, and um, thank you uh, for bringing us together like this at such short notice. I find it really difficult, if I'm honest, to follow what Rahima just said. I find it really, really upsetting to listen to the testimony of those like you, Rahima, who've got family who are going through this at the moment, and particularly the very powerful testimony that you just read out about people who have survived this process but have come through it utterly, utterly changed. And I just feel that it's very difficult to find the words to follow that, but we owe it to those people to try. So I will start by saying that the treatment of the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang is a scar on the conscience of the world and that was brought home to me very powerfully on two occasions last year. The first was when I had the opportunity to meet Rahima for the first time and to hear the harrowing heartbreaking reality of the systematic persecution of the Uyghur in Xinjiang, the forced sterilizations, the forced labour and other atrocities and I don't mind saying that the situation of women and children is something that I will never forget. It's the sort of testimony that you hear that leaves you with a lasting sense that you will not rest until something has been done to stop it. The second moment was on the Andrew Marr programme in June last year, when I think we all remember the absolutely chilling interview um, that unfolded. And just after that, as Phil said in his introductory remarks, Marie van der Zyl wrote to the Chinese ambassador on behalf of the Board of Deputies, and that way in which she laid out the similarities between what happened in Nazi Germany and what is happening today, the people being forcibly loaded onto trains, the, the beards of religious men being trimmed, the women being sterilised, the grim spectre of concentration camps. I think for those of us who've grown up knowing and learning only too well about the Holocaust with parents or in my case grandparents who fought in the war in order to stop that from happening we just feel absolutely that it would not be in keeping with the UK's tradition of standing up to mass atrocities to persecution and against that Holocaust to turn away now so I want to thank the APPG and I want to thank the board of deputies for the work that you've done to make it so crystal clear, as Ian said, that we can't in any conscience turn away. And I hope that that cross-party presence that Ian referred to here today, just in and of itself, sends a powerful message about the strength of feeling in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. We will not allow this to become a partisan issue. Nuss, Ian, Tom, Alistair, Lillian, Wes and I and all of the other MPs and peers on this call, we will stand together to make sure that the UK shows leadership on this. And I just want to echo something that Ian said too, you know, I'm, I represent the official opposition and we have plenty of knockabouts in the House of Commons. There are plenty of things that where we can choose to have party political disagreements and try and get one over on one another. This is not one of those issues. This is not about getting at the government. This is not about attacking the government. This is about making sure that we are on the right side of history in the United Kingdom and that our country lives up to the values that we claim to represent. And I, I was in the chamber earlier this week alongside many of the MPs here and heard very strong words from the Foreign Secretary about what is happening in Xinjiang. And I welcome those words, but I want to see those strong words backed up with similarly strong action. There are so many things that we could do, including targeted sanctions on the officials responsible in Xinjiang, including strengthening further the Modern Slavery Act. But most of all, what I wanted to underline today is that next week we have the opportunity to take a stand together when Lord Alton's amendment and other amendments to the trade bill return to the House of Commons, having had a very clear view expressed from the House of Lords that we must take this stand. 
against genocide and make sure that the UK is part of the solution and not part of the problem. And, you know, many of us start from different points um, polit on the political spectrum, whether it's about our relationship with China, whether it's our, about our approach to trade, whether it's about the precise mechanisms that we would personally or our parties would prefer in order to achieve our end goals. But we have found a way to come together in order to make sure that we don't just stand as bystanders while no action is taken, but that we compromise and we work together in order to make sure that the UK acts. So to end with the words of the chief rabbi last month, writing about the plight of the Uyghurs, he said, let no person say the responsibility lies with others. And next week, I think it's incumbent on all of us from every political party to lay aside whatever differences that we may have and make sure that the UK is on the right side of history. The responsibility doesn't lie anywhere else. It lies with us all. Thank you so much, um, Lisa. And thank you so much for working with all of us on our side of the house and ensuring that we get as many people going through the right lobby next week. Um, I'm going to now turn to the Right Honourable Alistair Carmichael, who also chairs, co-chairs the APPG on Uyghur. I can't see you on my screen, Alistair, but can you hear? I'm here. Go yes. for it, Alistair. You've got five minutes maximum. Okay. Um, well, thanks, Luz, and uh, thank you uh, to the Board of Deputies for uh, bringing this event together. And uh, as others have said, the lead that you have given in bringing attention to the plight of, of the Uyghur people. Um, you really need to be deaf, dumb and blind not to see the parallels with the Shoah. Um, but uh, like others, I would always be enormously uh, cautious about going into that territory. Uh, and, and I think it's right that we should be so. But for you to take the lead and to give the example that you have done, uh, just has been of enormous significance in, in this cause and uh, all credit to you for, for doing so. Um, you know, I was reflecting as I listened to Rahmina um, that, uh, that on the circumstances in which I became involved in this and it was a couple of years ago now that we set up the uh, all-party parliamentary group on Uyghurs uh, with myself and Yasmin Qureshi and it has been quite remarkable to see the way in which that has grown and blossomed and it has become a genuine all-party effort. You know Lisa said that we all you know in this case have to compromise and work together and I, I absolutely understand what she means by that but in fact this is one occasion where it's very easy for us all to work together without actually having to compromise very much because we all come at it from very much the same direction um, and uh, you know I, I reflect back in my own uh, involvement in it and I remember uh, having the, uh, the the slot on a uh, news night played to me by a former member of staff um, which was the item that had been filmed by John Sweeney the first time it had really hit network news in the UK and as is so often the case um, the question is not then how you know, why should I be involved in this? It is rather how knowing what I now know could I possibly not be? So uh, it's for that reason that I've become involved, I stay involved, and uh, I will be involved until this dreadful wrong is recognised and tackled uh, in the way that it absolutely has got to be. David Alton has done us all an enormous service by promoting his amendment in the House of Lords. I know that my Liberal Democrat colleagues and I will be there with you when it comes to a vote in the House of Commons. And I hope that that will then be the start of, of a process which will bring to us the, the ultimate goal that we seek to achieve here. Uh, an end to what we know is an emerging genocide uh, and the freedom and human rights of the Uyghur people. Thank you, Nis. Thank you so much, Alistair. And we're going to open it up into a discussion shortly. And as I said earlier, we have Arif um, with us who can help with any legal questions, technical questions, or any rebuttals that you may have had from um, within the party or outside the party. But before I do that, we're going to um, go to Christian. Christian Wakeford is the MP for Bury South. 
Christian, hope I pronounced that okay. okay. Christian, thank you so much for your support. I know it's not easy when you're elected to office. There are so many issues for you to get involved in, and we're so grateful that you're here helping us with this issue. Christian, do you want to um, reflect on what's been said? And you've got about four minutes. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Nuz. Um, I'd correct you slightly when you say it's Berry South, but uh, other than that, that's, that's fine. Um, like you said, uh, it's um, always a, a minefield as a, a new member to, to know uh, when, where and how to, to kind of make that stand. But if you can't do it on a matter of this severity, are, are you are you in the, the, the right field? Um, obviously, we, we are approaching Holocaust Memorial Day. And the theme for this year, as I said in the chamber the other day, is to be the light in the darkness. And it is time that we, as the UK, as the UK government, as parliamentarians, be that light in the darkness. But that is more than just saying strong words. That is actual taking serious action. The forced sterilisation, the forced removal of people, the internment camps, you know, this is this is ethnic cleansing. You know, we, we can't afford to mince words and we have to say it for what it is. And, and that is genocide. Um, and I think, as was said before, you know, we, we should have learned the lessons from 75 years ago. Unfortunately, we have failed to learn those lessons and there have been many more atrocities since then. But we need to take that stance now for what's going on in, in the Xinjiang province. Um, so like, like Lisa said, you know, sanctions do need to uh, take place, but they need to be meaningful, hard-hitting sanctions. Uh, we saw the Ch Chinese ambassador the, the other day for the United States not, not even denying what's going on, but appearing to celebrate the work they are doing in Xinjiang. And, and that, um, if it didn't send shivers down your spine, it, it certainly did for me and uh, certainly sent a very strong message that either they are completely um, immoral as to, to what they're doing, that they can't see it's wrong, or, or they just don't see there being a natural problem. Uh, so I, I, I was asked recently in uh, both the uh, Limud conference co a couple of weeks ago and at a local shul discussion group, what can MPs do? How can MPs help? And the truth is, most MPs probably don't even know this is a full issue. It's not in uh, the, the mainstream media on a daily basis. Uh, most MPs probably don't receive correspondence on a daily basis re regarding what's going on with, with the Uyghur. So to, to me, it's much more of a concern uh, um, so not, it's not just affecting our Muslim communities, our Jewish communities, with, with the memory going back to the Shoah. It is a hard-hitting message that we all need to learn from, we all need to take action, and we need to stand up. So my, my message to everyone, uh, no matter what community you live in, no matter where in the UK you are, speak to your friends, speak to your Member of Parliament, speak to whoever you can to make sure that as many people know about these atrocities as, as can do. Uh, and then obviously we well, we don't have a hard decision to make on Tuesday. We we have the right decision to make on Tuesday. And, and that is by saying, actually, we, we are open to trade. We are not against China and the, and the Chinese people. We are against a corrupt regime, which is co committing these atrocities on a daily basis. Uh, so whilst uh, many colleagues will, will be going through uh, the I lobby to, to be supporting this amendment, I, I too will be one of those because this needs to be the message we send that enough is enough and we are taking this seriously. Um, so I'll, I'll end it at that, uh, trying to be as brief as I can, Nuz, um, because all, all we can do is, is do the right thing. Christian, thank you so much. And for those people that aren't involved in, in politics, it's incredibly difficult if you're newly elected to, to do what Christian's going to do, which is walk through the lobby with us, because it, it's just, you know, it, it is tricky going forward. So Christian, we are incredibly grateful. I can't see anyone's hand raised. Because I can't, I'm going to ask the first question of Arif, but I can see lots of MPs on the line. So please raise your hands or put something in the chat box. Arif, there is some concern. What we're doing, we are outsourcing something and you know, the courts will be full of vexatious claims and trade deals will be, will be basically stuffed. Arif, can you explain the system so people can have confidence that this isn't going to stop any trade deal in, in, in track? And it, it's, it have to be quite a high marker to have any claims investigated. Absolutely. Um, thank, thank you very much, um, Nuss, and, and thank you for also um, inviting me here to speak. Um, the way this um, amendment operates is, is actually very precise, and it's, and it's very clear in what it's meant to do. What it is, is a group of interested parties, victims and survivors, may make an application to the High Court of the UK 
that application is conditional in having a trade agreement in place. Now, what happens is once an application is made, nothing happens to an underlying trade agreement. Basically, the High Court will look at the application and consider, firstly, whether it meets an applicability test. So, you know, vexatious claims get thrown out like all other cases get thrown out of a court. If you can't substantiate the claim, it's not going to get past the first hurdle. If it gets past the first hurdle, um, some of the speakers have mentioned that genocide is a very difficult test to meet. And so you would have to marshal a considerable amount of evidence in order to meet the test for genocide. If you were to meet that test, then of course the High Court can make a preliminary determination and that determination is then considered by the government. So during this whole process, there's no stage at which the trade, a trade agreement is affected during that process. It's only if there's a positive determination that a trade agreement would have to be considered for withdrawal by the government. Arif, thank you. One of our colleagues had a, a, a question and you basically answered it before they could raise it. Um, if they can indicate to me if they want to come back on anything, that would be great. Um, um, Imran, do you want to contribute to anything or do you have any other concerns that you need or any, anything else you wish to say, Imran? Um, I've got no questions because I'd be completely blank as to how anybody could question the worth and merit of uh, Alton's amendment um, and how on earth, as um, Sir Ian had mentioned, how on earth uh, any parliamentarian worth his salt could be uh, content not to support uh, this amendment uh, uh, and being the mother of parliaments. So I will be joining Christian and uh, hopefully many, many colleagues from all from both sides of the house on uh, Tuesday in supporting this amendment. Um, and I think that uh, any fair-minded person would feel compelled to do the same. Thank you so much, Imran. I think concerns were raised about the power of investigation, but the courts can only do a legal analysis about convictions and punishment, but they're also unfounded as well. This is it's just a legal analysis and then presenting that um, to, to the House to see how it wishes to take that forward. Andrew, you haven't raised your hand, Andrew Lua, and I'm anxious that you may not wish to speak, but if there's anything, anything, anything technical or any anxieties you have, do you want to maybe um, raise them now or nod if you don't want me to come to you? Well, this is really more for, for you and Ian and co and, and my other parliamentarians is just to make sure that we get the procedures right, given that there's so many proxy votes and what have you going on there. But that isn't something I want to detain other colleagues on here about. I just want to make sure that we, uh, you know, we, we, we get our ducks in a row in terms of how to actually do this. Andrew, you, you've hit on a very important point that Anne Duncan Smith and myself were dwelling on just this morning. Um, the vote will be on Tuesday. So if you wish to alert your proxy which way you want to vote, make sure you do that on Tuesday. If you want your proxy vote returned to yourself, make sure you um, let your proxy vote know and let the appropriate officials know in the House so you can vote yourself. It is going to be a busy Tuesday because there may be a number of amendments to vote on. But if you contact me, Ian or Bob Seeley, we will add you to a very tight WhatsApp group, Andrew, and we'll help direct people if, so they're alerted to when the vote is coming. I must say that if you wish to speak on Tuesday, the deadline to write to the speaker's um, email is one o'clock on Monday. So please put in to contribute. So whichever way you wish to vote, at least you've got an opportunity to speak and ask questions of the minister well before he summons up at the dispatch box. So getting to speak deadline is Monday and um, the vote will be on Tuesday. Are there any other questions? Gosh, everyone seems to be, um, no questions, which I'm, I'm a little bit surprised about. I'm going to allow Ian Duncan Smith to say a few words before I hand back over to Phil. Ian, um, just, you know, you're experiencing these matters and experience of dealing with, with colleagues across the house. Any final words of um, confidence you can give to colleagues? Um, and also just, just managing next week as well. Well, uh, there's not much I can say to my colleagues because at the end of the day, all these things are down to them. And they need to make the judgment based on what, they, uh, what they've seen and what they've heard today. 
the only comment I would make uh, is that all governments always tell MPs, backbench MPs, that it is not the time for this, uh, that there is going to be another vehicle coming down the road, which they can't see because it's just over the back of that hill, but it will be coming down the road. And that will, of course, be the right vehicle for this. So hold off on this because uh, we can do this better somewhere else at a different time and a different place. The answer to that is no. When there is something like this, you get one shot at it. You get one chance. Uh, and I only simply say to the question, it's people's in, in, you know, own independent opinion, but I simply say to everybody, you get one chance at this, and uh, when you wake up the following day and it didn't go through, then I, I don't think you particularly want to ask yourself the question, why did I not get it through? The answer is, as has been heard already by uh, Arif from Arif and others, this makes sense. Uh, this is a very high bar, uh, but it gives, what is the significance of it? It sends a signal around the world uh, that those who are persecuted and oppressed will be able to find their day in court and will be able to bring that oppression and that ghastliness to the notice of the judiciary and through that uh, to those who govern in on our behalf. And then maybe we just maybe will have started a process that says this will never, ever happen again and you will not get away with it. If that is what we do, then we'll have done something good. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, a number of people have indicated, does Tom want to speak? Tom Randall, but Tom Randall and I are WhatsApping, so I don't think he's going to want to contribute we're, we're chatting. Well, you can, Tom. Tom, for, Tom forgive me. Um, would you like the floor? Um, can somebody unmute Tom Randall, please? I'm afraid. Um, but well, thank, well that, that's been great. Thank, thank you for the um, for the briefing. I haven't. I, I will confess, I haven't looked at the detail of everything yet. So that's been a really good introduction to this to this subject. I suppose one question, um, a bit of a sort of counterfactual that that, that comes to me is, as I've been listening to this, um, had this legislation, the the amendment that we're discussing, had it been in place for the last few years, let's say. Are, are there any other circumstances in which it would have been applied, do we think? Um, I'm just sort of trying to sort of think of sort of practical examples of where it may or may not have worked, up, aside from the, the current examples in China that we've been discussing. Well, that? I mean, I'm going, I can hand over to Lord Alton and um, Arif in a moment, mm -hmm. but but Tom, it's such a high threshold to reach genocide. Mm -hmm. And I think what's remarkable on what's happening in Xinjiang is that the evidence is mounting mostly because sure. the Chinese state keeps promoting what they are doing. And it's also, we're, we're complicit because the products that are produced by the slavery ends up here on our, you know, every, we're surrounded by it. So it's not a situation where previously genocide took place somewhere else and did not touch us at all. But unfortunately it impacts us right here, right now. But I see that Lord Alton's unmuted himself. So Lord Alton, would you like to say a few words? Well, Tom asked a very good question. And I, one example I would give, I referred to it in my remarks earlier on, but it's in parenthesis, and that's the situation in Burma. And I think it's a very good example where we would have been able to do more the moment we saw the signs of genocide emerging, our failure to act there, I, I'm vice chairman of the All Party Group on the Rohingya and the All Party Group on Burma, our failure to act in those circumstances has led to 700,000 people having to flee out of Burma, mainly into Bangladesh, but other neighboring countries, the sight of people in rickety boats on the Andaman Sea or being caught up in the most desperate conditions imaginable, I think fills us all with horror. The Magnitsky powers that the, sec the Foreign Secretary has introduced, and I strongly welcome that, has enabled us at last to target one or two of the individuals concerned. But we could have acted, should have acted, we could have put this before the High Court of England and Wales, there was enough evidence which had emerged, and immediately we would have declared that this is a genocide. Now, the effect that would have in the world would have been phenomenal. And I want to see global Britain, I want to see this country standing up for the values that we care for. We are a great liberal democracy. Our institutions are something we should be enormously proud of. And I'm sure that if the evidence about the Rohingya had been laid before uh, our judiciary, then they would have arrived at a determination. 
So they would have had, as Ian put it a few moments ago, their day in court. So I think that's one good example. I, I suppose one could roll the clock back to, to others. I, I mentioned Darfur in my remarks earlier on. And trade is an issue with Sudan. It might have been one of the things we could have moved earlier. But I think Burma is, is perhaps a better example and, and certainly very relevant as far as the Uyghurs in Xinjiang are concerned. Thank you, Lord Alton. That's useful. Thank you. Or if there's anything else you want to raise, I think there may be concerns that people may believe that so many cases may start coming forward and the UK courts may be a place for lots of other people from other countries bringing cases forward too. Yes, I mean, of course, the UK has dealt with all sorts of claims emanating from all sorts of places for a very long time. And, and that, that argument could be literally used with any area of law. I mean, from housing to immigration, you can say that the courts will be flooded by claims. But of course, our courts and our judges are equipped to deal with applications and dismiss the irrelevant and ones that have no basis from the ones that have a real basis. Uh, Tom's obviously referred to past precedents, and, and Lord Alton has rightly mentioned the case of the Rohingya. Now, the case of the Rohingya is, is really emblematic because actually this is a case where actually a third state, Gambia, has brought um, Burma before the International Court of Justice. Now, you might say, well, if we are so strong on prohibiting, uh, preventing, and punishing perpetrators of genocide, why didn't the UK bring a case to the International Court of Justice? You know, we are a party to the Genocide Convention. Um, and so uh, there is that mechanism, the International Court of Justice. However, um, you can't use the International Court of Justice as a dispute resolution mechanism if there's a reservation to the convention, and you can't use it also unless a state refers another state to the International Court of Justice. If you've got a reservation, you're completely precluded. Um, so, so Burma is an exceptional case where there was no reservation on the convention, and another state, a third state, was willing to refer it. The only other two major precedents that we have is obviously Bosnia and Rwanda. Now, in both those cases, the UN Security Council had actually set up a court or tribunal to deal with those matters. Now, of course, the UN Security Council can only do that if nobody vetoes um, the setting up of those courts or tribunals. Now, I can't say much about the Uyghurs because I'm, I'm involved with the um, Uyghur tribunal. And obviously, we're starting this determination completely um, fresh but what I can say is that obviously China has a reservation on the genocide convention which means that the only mechanism which allows for an interstate dispute which is the International Court of Justice you cannot utilize it the only other option is if the UN Security Council refers China to the International Court of Justice which of course it can't because China sits on the UN Security Council so essentially any state responsibility is completely precluded and individual responsibility is precluded because the only international court that can deal with individuals is the ICC. Now, the China, China isn't a party to the ICC. The only way you can get it to the ICC is through a UN Security Council referral, which obviously you can't get if China was to veto it or any other state. So essentially the argument that international courts can determine these issues is just not correct because actually there isn't a mechanism here in order to deal with the issue of genocide. Bringing it to the UK court will allow that determination and then responsibilities will flow from that. Beautifully put, Arif, in the chilling situation that we're in. And um, we've, we've come up to our deadline, I'm afraid. So I'm just gonna hand over to Phil to close um, this event for us. Phil, over to you. Thank you so much, Nusrat. And I want to thank everyone who's spoken today so very, very powerfully. Uh, it's been inspiring to see the cross-party consensus on this issue, and we hope that this will carry forward to, the, D, to the, um, the vote on Tuesday. In particular, I'd like to thank you, Nusrat, for the wonderful chairing and the leadership you've shown on this issue, but also to sit in Duncan Smith, Lord Alton, Shadow Foreign Secretary Lisa Nandy, Alistair Carmichael, Foreign Affairs, Select Committee Chair Tom Tugendhat, Christian Wakeford, and all who've joined us and contributed so powerfully. And I think we all owe our very special thanks to Rahima Mahmoud, who, along with the World Uyghur Congress, has done so much to raise our awareness of this very, very grave issue. And she does so, so bravely, as you've seen today, 
and provides an incredible service, not just to us, but to all of humanity in so doing. So thank you so much, Rahima. Um, when our president, Marie van der Zyl, wrote to the Chinese ambassador, she did receive a reply. And I just share one of the things that was most shocking about it. As well as the usual spin lines, at a certain point in the letter from the Chinese ambassador, he boasted that in the UN there had been a, a, a move to congratulate China for its humanitarian treatment of the Uyghurs, which was a huge surprise to us, and I'm sure it will be to you. So we looked this up, who, who, had, uh, who had promoted this. And uh, it was a, a measure sponsored by Belarus, the last dictatorship in Europe, seconded by the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and a laundry list of the worst human rights abuses in the world. Now, any of us would not have been uh, delighted to have received such a claim, but the Chinese clearly thought, the Chinese Communist Party clearly thought this was uh, to be proud of. And I think this just tells you what we're dealing with here. Um, the Board of Deputies, together with the World Uyghur Congress, has produced a briefing paper, which it will send out to MPs this afternoon. I know Nusrat has sent uh, something similar, or, or might be the same thing already, but no harm in getting it twice. Uh, which will provide further information about the amendment and some frequently asked questions. And we'll also send uh, the video, the link to this uh, discussion, which I think will be illuminating for those colleagues who wanted to be here but weren't able to. Just lastly, I'd say everyone who's come here, please urge all colleagues on all sides of the House to, uh, to back this amendment. Uh, as we've heard, it's, it's, it shouldn't be a partisan issue. It should be an issue of common consensus and, and natural conscience. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to be in touch with us on this or indeed any other issue. Uh, we are here to support you in your work. I cannot underscore the importance we place on this issue, and I thank you once again for your time this afternoon. It really is appreciated.